Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. As we've mentioned countless times on this channel, there really is no end to the weird and sometimes hilarious crime stories that we come across during our research. And because we've been covering a lot of really heavy stuff lately, we decided it might be nice to change gears a bit and take a look at some of the lighter stories from the world of true crime that we've collected over the last little while that we've wanted to share with you. These are cases where, whether through bad luck, stupidity, or something else entirely, perpetrators ended up essentially handing themselves directly over to police. Just before we get into today's stories, if you find our content interesting and informative and haven't already, we'd be honored if you'd take a second to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell. It helps you to keep up to date with our latest releases and helps us to keep up with that pesky, ever-changing YouTube algorithm. With that out of the way, let's get to the video. No matter how tired or cliche a saying gets, it always seems like there's at least one person out there that could have benefited from hearing it one more time. Usually, before they were about to do something incredibly reckless or stupid. Case in point, the classic, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. The meaning behind the phrase, of course, has come to be that one should be adequately prepared or equipped for a given situation. However, it's also perfectly fine advice when taken literally. You probably shouldn't bring an actual knife to an actual gunfight either. As one Oregon man proved about a decade ago, a baseball bat isn't much more help either. It all started on the afternoon of July 25th, 2013, when a 22-year-old man named Derek Mosley reportedly decided to commit a robbery at a store in the city of Beaverton. According to news sources from the time the 22-year-old walked inside, baseball bat in hand, and proceeded to smash a glass display case. However, it wasn't long before things went sideways. You see, Mosley wasn't trying to rob any old store. He had walked through the doors of a little establishment called Discount Gun Sales. As you might imagine, since they were literally in the business of selling guns, Mosley quickly found himself staring down the barrel of one of these weapons, which was being pointed at him by the store's manager. The 22-year-old was ordered to drop the bat and get down on the floor, which he did and was held until police arrived. Apparently, Mosley also had a 9-inch long knife on him at the time of his arrest, so even if you forget the whole baseball bat thing, he quite literally did bring a knife to a gunfight. Now, if we're being ultra-charitable, as some outlets were at the time of the 2013 incident, we could point out that Mosley might have assumed that since it was a gun store he was robbing, and not like a shooting range, the weapons wouldn't have been loaded. But to that, we would also say that if you're going to go to a place where guns are sold, you should probably figure that the people that work there likely take their rights to personal protection pretty seriously. Anyway, while we unfortunately weren't able to find any updates concerning what ultimately happened to Mosley, sources from the Times state that he was charged with offenses including first-degree robbery, first-degree theft, and second-degree criminal mischief. We were initially going to include this next one in last week's Crimes of the Week video, but for obvious reasons, as you'll see, we decided it fit better here instead. On February 24th, 2023, officers at the NYPD's 112 Precinct in Queens' Forest Hills neighborhood realized that they had been hit by a vandal. The culprit had slashed a single tire on four marked NYPD vehicles and three unmarked vehicles at around 7 a.m. that morning. Video surveillance from the area managed to capture images of the suspect, who it was revealed was wearing a brown hat, multicolored jacket, and black pants at the time, and it hopped into a beige SUV before driving off. Naturally, the police department released these images of the unknown suspect and his vehicle, hoping that they might receive assistance from the public. What they didn't expect was to receive assistance from the suspect himself. However, to their surprise, just two days later, that's exactly what happened when a man came in to report that his vehicle had been stolen. 
The man, later identified as 74-year-old Jose Patino, was wearing a brown hat, multicolored jacket, and black pants. In fact, police quickly realized that these were the exact same brown hat, jacket, and pants that the tire-slashing suspect had been wearing a couple days earlier. Though it's not mentioned in reports, presumably the vehicle he was there to report missing was a beige SUV. According to local media, when asked about the crime, Patino confessed, leading him to be arrested and charged with criminal mischief. Apparently, the 74-year-old had no prior arrests, though that's probably a good thing considering how badly his first alleged attempt at crime went. Currently, police say it's not clear why the elderly man carried out the vandalism. As the title of the video states, in most of today's stories, we're dealing with cases where people essentially handed themselves over to police. However, with this next subject, there's no essentially required. The only thing that could have made this crime any more perfect is if the man pulled the Monopoly chance card out of his pocket to explain his actions when it was all over. Because let me tell you folks, he did not pass go, did not collect $200, but he did go directly to jail. Well prison, to be exact. It all started at around 3.30 a.m. on January 15, 2008, when a resident in the village of Ossining, New York, called to report a suspected crime in progress. The caller said that they had heard a crashing sound coming from the Southside Mini Mart, next to where they lived on Spring Street. Sure enough, when officers arrived at the scene, they discovered a 23-year-old man named Blake Leak, who was in the middle of a burglary. Now, Blake already had quite the rap sheet, having at least 24 prior arrests at the time and being suspected of carrying out at least four other burglaries at this same mini-mart. Needless to say, he couldn't really afford to be caught there again, so once police got there, he took off running. It turned out that Blake was fairly quick on his feet, managing to get ahead of the officers who were chasing him. It seemed like luck was on his side once again when two of the officers took a nasty fall down an embankment, causing one to hurt their back and another to break their finger. Taking advantage of the extra time afforded to him, it was at this point that the 23-year-old reportedly decided to seek shelter on the grounds of a large building. Unfortunately for Blake, the property he had just trespassed onto was none other than the Sing Sing Correctional Facility, a maximum security state prison. In no time, he was intercepted by one of the facility's guards and placed under arrest. After being taken into custody, Blake was charged with that burglary, plus one that had happened a few days prior in which he had allegedly stolen lottery tickets. It's unclear whether the 23-year-old was ever convicted, though reports mention that he was also suspected in those other mini-mart robberies at the time, so it seems pretty unlikely that he got away scot-free. If you've ever smoked marijuana before, then chances are you know that it can make you a bit paranoid. Some people are definitely more susceptible to this than others, but I think most people at least know someone who this has happened to, particularly if you started smoking when you were a teenager. You know, like that one friend who refused to order his own food while you were out because he thought everyone at the McDonald's knew he was high or the wannabe high school drug dealer who was convinced he was on a government watch list even though he was selling like five dime bags a week. However, none of these stoner stereotypes even come close to the two guys in this next segment. If there were some sort of medal for the most paranoid overreaction on weed ever recorded, I can confidently say these two would walk away with gold every time. According to reports, it all started on January 15th, 2015, when our hapless duo, 22-year-old Leland Ayala Doliente and 23-year-old Holland Sward decided to try and transport 20 pounds of marijuana from Las Vegas to Bozeman, Montana. Honestly, the whole thing was like the setup for a late-night comedy. The guys simply hopped into their car with all of the bricks of weed and even had an animal sidekick, a pit bull who they were supposed to return to someone along the way. I mean, even the guys' names are perfect. Leland and Holland totally sound like a buddy comedy duo to us. Anyway, for most of the journey, everything was going great for the pair. They had made it all the way through Nevada, Utah, and most of the way through Idaho, covering almost 700 miles. 
They were now on U.S. Route 20 and had less than 200 miles to go when they started to notice something. They were being followed. At first, it was just one car, but as Leland and Holland started to pay more attention, they noticed more and more. They pulled off the highway in the city of Rexburg to let the heat die down a bit, but it was no use. There were plainclothes police officers in unmarked cars circling them everywhere. Sensing the jig was up, the men got out of their vehicle in the parking lot of a local Applebee's and tried to flag down some of the unmarked cars. None of them stopped, even though the men kept trying to signal their surrender. They even got their weed out of the car and threw it all into a plastic garbage bag in a dog cage which they placed on the sidewalk to show that they meant business. Still, nothing happened. Frustrated and evidently believing that the police were toying with them, that's when Leland and Holland decided to call 911. The thing was though, Leland and Holland were not being followed by the police. In fact, no one had any idea who they were. Those unmarked cars they were trying to flag down were unmarked because they were regular cars with regular, albeit likely very confused, drivers inside of them. It turned out that Leland and Holland had just been getting way too high on their smuggling drive and had let their paranoia get the best of them. The resulting 911 call is one of the most incredible pieces of audio I think I've ever heard in my life. In it, Leland confesses to an extremely confused 911 operator that he and Holland have driven 20 pounds of marijuana into Idaho and says that he knows police are watching them. He then states that he just wants it to end and that they should come and take them to jail already. Here's a snippet of that call. Hi, uh, where are the two dumbasses that got caught uh, trying to... Uh bring some stuff through your border and all your cops are just driving around us like a bunch of jack wagons. I just really would like you guys to end it. If you guys, if you could help me out with that, we just like to get, get on with it. You got caught doing what? Ah, uh, God. Okay. Um, we kind of got pooch here trying to bring some stuff across your Idaho border. Okay. And, uh, yeah, a bunch of your cops driving around a bunch of civilian cars just not want to pick us up. I don't know what's, what's the deal. I was just wondering if you could help us out and just end it. Okay. Um. Yeah. Honestly, the best parts of that whole thing, in our opinion, are the pauses while the dispatcher tries to figure out what the hell is going on, particularly that pause at the end. We'll leave a link to the whole 911 call in the description below as well, in case you're interested, because it goes on like that for a while. Needless to say, after Leland gave the dispatcher all of the information about who they were and where they were, officers did actually arrive at the scene and place them under arrest. Reports from the Times state that when police got there, Leland and Holland were already waiting with their hands on their heads. They were each charged with one felony count of trafficking marijuana. If you're feeling bad for these guys, don't worry, it looks like things didn't turn out too badly for them in the end. While Holland was given a five-year sentence, this was suspended by a judge and he was placed on probation for five years and ordered to serve just 30 days in jail. Leland, meanwhile, ended up being sentenced to one and a half years in prison, but only because he tested positive for marijuana, cocaine, and oxycodone on the day of his sentencing. Now, I may be in the minority here, but personally, the threat of violent crime has never put me in much of a romantic mood. Maybe you're different, though, like the subject of this next case, who evidently thought that he could two-for-one a terrifying robbery into a potential dating opportunity. According to reports, the whole situation unfolded on the night of September 5th, 2009, when a man and woman, Daniel Martinez Batista and Diana Martinez, were walking through the parking lot of their apartment complex in Columbus, Ohio. It's unclear if they were going out or coming home at the time, but what we do know is that at approximately 10.40 p.m., they found themselves face to face with three armed male attackers. The men waved a gun in their face and stole Daniel's wallet and Diana's purse before neighbors who were alerted by the commotion threatened the robbers and they ran off. Though this was likely traumatizing enough on its own, 
The situation took a whole other bizarre turn less than two hours later when there was a knock at the victim's apartment door. A man, later identified as 20-year-old Stefan Bennett, was standing there. Diana immediately recognized him as one of the suspects who had just robbed her. Unbelievably, he had come back to ask her out on a date. Thankfully, police were quickly called and the 20-year-old was placed under arrest. While police at the time were quoted as saying that they weren't exactly sure what Stefan was thinking when he came back to the crime scene, I feel like this really doesn't even begin to cut it. Like in this man's wildest dreams, what did he think was going to happen? Like, was he going to ask her out and she was going to be like, Oh, yes, please. Maybe we can see a movie with some of the money you just f***ing robbed from me. Let me get my coat. Also, most news sources seem to suggest that the other victim was this woman's boyfriend. So, like, in what world, buddy? In what world? Anyway, there were a million questions we have for this guy, but unfortunately, we weren't able to find any updates on this story. Reports at the time state that police were still looking for Stefan Bennett's alleged accomplices and that he was being held on a charge of aggravated robbery at the Franklin County Jail on $100,000 bond. Far be it for me to criticize anyone's choice of tattoos, but it seems like if you're going to put something permanent on your body, you should at least be aware that it has the potential to become an identifying feature, whether desired or not. Depending on the circumstances, it might literally identify you, as one Idaho man found out much to his chagrin a few years ago. It all started on March 31st, 2012, when an officer with Idaho's Twin Falls Police Department spotted three men and a dog walking while on patrol near 3rd Avenue West and Gooding Street. It was about 12.30 in the morning, and the men were walking in the middle of the road. And the officer asked them to move to the sidewalk, likely concerned that they might get hit by a driver who wasn't paying attention or couldn't see them. However, when the officer approached the men, he saw one of them make a movement as if they were going to run away. Suspicious of this, the officer asked all three of the men to provide identification. Two members of the group were fine. But when the police officer looked up the third man, who said his name was Emiliano Valesco, he couldn't find any matching records. That's when the officer noticed a clearly visible tattoo on the man's left forearm that read Contreras. On a hunch, he looked up this name using the same date of birth info that the man had provided. Sure enough, a file with a matching picture came back. The guy's real name was Dylan Edward Contreras and he had three outstanding warrants for failing to appear in court. The 19-year-old was arrested and also charged with providing false information and underage drinking. As angry as Dylan reportedly was when the officer showed him a picture of himself before placing him in handcuffs, it seems he didn't actually learn anything from the encounter. Less than five months later, he was arrested in connection with a robbery and assault case after a witness was able to identify him once again, because he hadn't bothered to cover up the tattoo giving away his last name. You would think that if he wasn't willing to give up his life of crime, at the very least, he would have invested in a long sleeve shirt. Whether he would have eventually figured this out or not on his own is unclear, but it seems that either way, he never got that chance. In August of that year, he was arrested for yet another violent incident, for which he was sentenced to life in prison. Imagine, if you will, the following scenario. You're a 19-year-old first-time criminal who has, for whatever reason, decided to go on a bit of a crime spree. You've taken some marijuana and a pipe from one vehicle, completely stolen another vehicle, and to round everything out, have now robbed a bank at gunpoint and made off with a few thousand dollars. The police could be on to you, but for now at least, you've managed to get away. Do you A get as far away from the crime scene as possible, hoping that your ill-gotten money and car will help you survive for at least a little while as a fugitive. B. Turn yourself in, seeing as you've never done this before and might be able to use your young age and lack of criminal record to beg for leniency. Or C. Go home and film and upload a YouTube video in which you not only brag about committing all of these crimes, but make sure to wave around as much of the evidence as possible on camera. 
If you answered C, then you might just be the subject of our final story. According to reports, the whole thing started on November 27, 2012, when a then 19-year-old woman named Hannah Sabata walked into the Cornerstone Bank in Waco, Nebraska. After walking up to the front desk armed with a gun and a pillowcase, she proceeded to slip one of the tellers a note. It read, quote, You are being robbed. No alarms or locks or phones or ink bags. I have a loaded gun. You have two minutes. The bank employees did as Hannah demanded, handing over $6,256 in cash before she fled the scene in a stolen Pontiac Grand Am. While images taken of Hannah on the bank's surveillance system were quickly circulated by police, resulting in a number of tips, it turned out that these leads were just icing on the cake for investigators. This was because instead of doing what most bank robbers do, you know, trying to hide the fact that you've committed a crime so that you can actually keep the stolen money, Hannah went directly home to film and upload a YouTube video to brag about the whole thing. The resulting video, which she titled Chick Bank Robber, details the 19-year-old's crime spree and can perhaps be best described as nearly eight uninterrupted minutes of early YouTube cringe. And if you think I'm just being mean, Honestly, I invite you to go and take a look for yourself. It's still up to this day. We've included a link in the description below. Let me know if you managed to get all the way through. For everyone else, here's the highlights. Hannah doesn't speak in the video, but instead writes on a series of pieces of paper which she holds up to the camera. The messages appear backwards in the actual footage, but have been supplemented with subtitles after the fact. The whole thing is done over a backing track of songs by the band Green Day, who Hannah also gave a shout out in the description of her video, which reads, quote, I just stole a car and robbed a bank. Now I'm rich, I can pay off my college financial aid, and tomorrow I'm going for a shopping spree. Bite me, I love Green Day. In the actual messages Hannah holds up, she states among other things, quote, I told my mom today was the best day of my life. She just thinks I met a new boy. I'm going for a shopping spree. Bite me. During this time, the 19-year-old fans out and waves around a stack of $100 bills and also holds up keys from what she explains is the stolen car. Another sign reads, quote, The shiny new car is a Pontiac Grand Am. Of course, I already took the license plates off and threw them out. Unfortunately for Hannah, unlike her crime spree, her shopping spree would never come to pass. She was arrested the day after the bank robbery, still wearing the same clothes that she had been when she committed the crime. Reports from the Times state that all but $30 worth of the stolen money was recovered at the teen's house when she was taken into custody. Several months later, Hannah was given a sentence of 10 to 20 years in prison for the crimes. The most up-to-date sources we could find state that she was eventually released on parole though it was subsequently revoked, and most recently, she got in trouble for assaulting a prison guard. At the time of this recording, she's still incarcerated. Though this story definitely gets a well-deserved facepalm in our opinion, the one thing we will say in fairness to Hannah is that in addition to her young age, the whole baiting yourself out on social media thing was a lot less common and probably obvious back in 2012 than it is today. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, you'll definitely know that there are still plenty of people getting in trouble for stuff like this, but unlike Hannah, they definitely have less of an excuse these days not to know that it's a dumb idea. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching and take care.